Hello everyone and welcome to the space shuttle from launch to landing. Here we have the shuttle Atlantis and in its cargo bay we have a TDRS satellite and also Canadarm which I hope to test. We'll have to see whether that works out. It's a lot of infernal robotics hijinks and so I'm a little bit nervous about that. Uh, we have the TDRS satellite on uh, inertial upper stage which means there's two stages actually, uh, one to boost it out to geosynchronous transfer orbit and then the other to circularize. And both of these are placed on a hinge, so we tilt it out of the cargo bay and then boost it up. Well, I mean, we'll have the shuttle separate off at a safe distance. Anyway, uh, so that's what we've got as cargo and that's about 15.7 uh, tons of cargo. Uh, including the upper stages there. So it's uh, fairly heavy. The shell's capacity is about 25 tons, though that depends on the particular version of the shuttle. So uh, since I did the rocket profile on the space shuttle, I've gotten some questions about how all this works out. And basically, this shuttle here is the component uh, space shuttle, CSS for short, and it already has its own realism overhaul configurations, uh, the best way to find the thread is to type Mike NZ in the forums, and uh, it's uh, because he was the l last adapter of this particular shuttle, I should say. Basically, it's gone through quite a number of iterations and updates and uh, making sure compatibility checks. The last functional version of this was for KSP 1.1.2. This is in KSP 1.1.3, uh, so that is that. The engines, though, uh, I didn't like the look of the engines that came with the component space shuttle and so what we're, we've got here are engines from the space launch system mod which uh, look a little bit too clean I guess uh, but they work well so that's a good plus. It's important that things actually work. Okay I don't know about the aerodynamics of this particular shuttle. I'm assuming that FAR is just going to handle it properly but I, I've noticed that it has a little bit more glide to it than I would normally expect a shuttle to have. So there's that. Um, then again, the shuttle is a glider. I mean, people say it flies like a brick, but that's in comparison to a normal plane, where normal planes have a very good glide, well, you know, uh, on average, okay glide slope, but uh, compared to the shuttle, a very good glide slope when uh, holding the same speed. Uh, in other words, they don't drop so much per horizontal distance that they go. Uh, the shuttle drops a lot per horizontal distance that it goes. I'm not quite sure that this is... Th th it doesn't feel quite right. So there's that. Now, I didn't use the external tank or the boosters from the component space shuttle mod pack. And the reason I didn't use the external tank, and it's a sad thing too because it has a very nice connector to the shuttle and it looks very realistic and everything, but the reason is because it comes all in one piece and therefore it gets unbalanced. And so I decided to build it out of procedural parts instead. And so these are all procedural parts tanks, carefully weighted to be somewhere between the lightweight uh, external tank and then the super lightweight external tank. So somewhere between those two. For the first few missions, there was the regular external tank for the space shuttle, but they eventually came up with ways to make it lighter and uh, most of the space shuttle missions up to a certain point were light, the lightweight tank and then eventually they came up with the super lightweight tank which is only 22 tons dry. So this is somewhere between the two later ones and the key thing about the external tank is that the oxygen is at the top and the hydrogen is at the bottom. If you take a look at the mass of the hydrogen tanks here you see 59 tons and uh, here 48 tons. So basically you're talking about 100 tons down here. And then up here you see 236 tons, uh, 294 tons, and there's, there's a little bit in the inner stage as well. Um, and that's actually shared between the two fuels. But uh, So it's much heavier up here. And that is what allows the shuttle's main engines to go through the center of mass throughout the entire launch. So we can see this is currently the center of thrust with all of the boosters on and here is the center of mass so it's very well balanced and eventually that center of mass is going to go towards the shuttle as the external tank empties but critically it's not going to move down 
which it would otherwise do. After the external tank, uh, we've got the boosters, and I again decided not to use the ones from the CSS shuttle because they didn't attach quite right and separate separate quite blah, 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 separate quite right. Um, so I used the ones from SSTU, and these have RO configurations. I've edited the plumes so that they have real plumes now. Uh, for some reason, there was uh, um, some sort of because. Uh, Realism Overhaul tried to make real plumes for it, but it didn't seem to be showing up. I just fixed it. Um, I did put little separatrons in the external tank, which it would not normally have. That's just to make sure it safely gets clear of the shuttle without any additional hijinks in the launch script to move the shuttle away. Uh, so we will be having a launch script. We will be having a re-entry script, both uh, KOS, but the deployment of the cargo and all that and moving the TDRS satellite into its proper orbit will be managed by me. So without further ado, let's try and launch this. Uh, let's see our crew. Uh, we don't need everybody, Gene Pond and Valentina. Um, oh, okay, we'll have Valentina too. All right, so four crew for the space shuttle and let's get started. That's an interesting sound. Lots of e extra echo for some reason. So as you can see, handling a role program, I had the longest uh, delay in trying to get this working right, and it turns out it was because of having SAS on, out of all things. And so uh, thankfully, a uh, fellow Twitch live streamer named Dumbaratu came around and told me just to have SAS off and that solved all the problems. Um, he is very familiar with KOS and uses KOS a lot, so... This could be faster. I think the shuttle did do the roll program faster than this. But I don't want to push my luck as far as stability is concerned. Interesting to note that actually the shuttle did have its control surfaces doing stuff during launch. Uh, just to relieve stress on the wings and the airframe. Uh, so it, they weren't locked. Uh, they, they were used uh, by the computer to make sure that things didn't like snap off due to all of the stress. You'll note that the throttle goes down as we pass through max Q. And once we get through max Q, it will throttle up again, as the shuttle does. One nice thing about having the real plumes configuration on these SRBs is that now they have a little bit of flame as they separate. Uh, it's uh, deceptive. They still have a lot of thrust even though they're tailing off here 3,000, 2,000-ish kilonewtons. And they separate off when they get to 400 kilonewtons. As you can see. But they still have a little bit of flame there, so that's nice. It's always tough to talk about the burn times of the Space Shuttle's SRBs because they do continue burning for a long time. So yeah, they do have that thrust curve. One nice thing about this particular model, it has the external tank doors. Uh, now if we had the external tank from the mod, th th that would attach properly to those doors. But a uh, cute little thing that will happen is when we prepare for our first OMS burn, you'll see those doors close. Now one trouble with this particular model was that its landing gear was not fixed uh, for since the 64-bit transition and if you recall, oh, there's the TR satellite. If you recall, let me see if I can find the landing gear. Um, yeah, landing gears got glitched and so these landing gears are glitched so I, I also added in stock landing gear to serve for landing. The landing gear that's built into the shuttle would not work. So we're going to use the stock landing gear for that. There seems to be some imbalance between the liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. I'll have to fix that. I thought I had gotten it right, so I'm not entirely sure why there should be any any gap. The the shuttle's engines can burn for up to eight minutes, by the way. So that's how much fuel is in the external tank. 
that doesn't include the whole thrall down possibility so eight minutes uh, regardless of thrall down you can see we have plenty of delta v we're not carrying the full load for the space shuttle even if you're trying to build a stock shuttle this is the tricky part and this is why you have to have the center of mass up here because otherwise the engines will eventually not be going through the center of mass the balance of the space shuttle is exquisite and you can see from this turn this was very tough to do because at first at the beginning of this turn the engines are pointing up a net 10 degrees above the actual uh, nose of the craft because uh, on the body they are tilted by 10 degrees but by the end of this roll to make sure that the external tank is facing down they're pointing down by 10 degrees with respect to the nose and so you'll see that the the nose position is drifting up as well to compensate for that 20 degree difference at this point in the launch script it's all about uh, managing the time to apoapsis and we actually want to end up normally for a rocket what you want to do is you want to finish the burn at the time to apoapsis in this case we don't want to do that that would be if we wanted to end up with a circular orbit at the end of this burn but we don't want to end up with a circular orbit we want the external tank to descend into the atmosphere so this launch script has to be different from all the others in that it has to leave some time to apoapsis so that we can decouple the external tank get away from it and then use the OMS engines to finish the orbit. So we leave the external tank suborbital. Now we're getting to pretty high g-forces and one annoyance that I've had is that the TDRS satellite seems to like to drift up and try to go past the cargo bay doors here and that's due to it being on a hinge. It'd be trivial to start it up properly on the side here you know add some struts here and then it won't do that the problem with that is if we do strut it up on the sides the hinge won't work and so uh, the hinge will uh, just not be able to tilt up the payload so we have to put up with uh, just limiting the g-forces to a kinder gentler acceleration getting close to where we separate the external tank here okay All right, and now uh, coasting two apoapsis for the OMS burn. I've got persistent rotation, so yeah, the shuttle does this little tumble. So in order for my re-entry script to work, I have to end up at a 300 kilometer by 300 kilometer orbit. Now, if I wanted to do something like, like visit the ISS or something like that, which is in a 400 kilometer orbit or higher, then I would have to bring that orbit back down again after rendezvousing with the ISS. Um, I'll eventually test out my re-entry script to see what I need to do to uh, come back from higher orbits, uh, though that may or may not be safe. I don't know if the shuttle uh, would come back down directly from those higher orbits or would just uh, go down to a lower orbit first in a standby orbit and then descend. I'm pretty sure that it would normally go down to a standby orbit, perhaps even lower than 300 kilometers uh, but for now I'm using 300 kilometers it seems to work and it's a nice happy medium okay uh, and so let me round this out with a 300 kilometer periapsis and apoapsis and then we'll deploy the TDRS satellite okay now once in orbit of course the space shuttle opened its cargo bay and that's to radiate heat And there we have our payload. But, uh, well, before we do payload stuff, maybe there's a good chance to play around with the Canada arm. Now, this Canada arm, I think it says it's, and uh, it's a short version here. It says it's for um, for the DECQ uh, space shuttle, so it's meant for that. But And actually, it didn't attach to the, the, the node that was here meant for, I guess, a different Canada arm. I don't know which Canada arm was supposed to go there, but I think this one will work a little bit better. Uh, this shoulder one is actually side to side. Uh, shoulder two is up or down. Oh wait, I have to unlock all the things. I I had 
uh, the hinges and everything locked for safety's sake. But I had that on Action Group 5. Now, of course, uh, once we go back into the atmosphere, we should lock them again, so it's a toggle. Okay, so, Canada Arm seems to work just fine. Let's uh, circularize our orbit and then deploy the TRS satellite. We will want to, of course, deploy the satellite uh, so that it begins its burn close to the equator for simplicity. Now, the cute thing... Okay, not the cute thing. The really annoying thing <laughs> about launching with the inertial upper stages is because they are solid rocket boosters and they're two SRBs, um, they have a set amount of delta V, and regardless of what payload you have. So they have a max payload to geostationary orbit, and in this case, uh, we're far less than that max payload, of course, which means they have far more delta V than we need. Uh, the downside to that is we have to find a way to use that Delta V because they don't shut off. We have to sort of make our maneuvers in a very odd way in order to make sure that uh, we use up all the fuel but it still gets us to where we want to go. So there's a trick to that and I'm still learning that trick. Basically you need to do a whole bunch of radial stuff and inefficient stuff. You have to add inefficiency to, whole, to the whole thing uh, to make it all work out. So we're just going to apoapsis. This is not a normal role for, for the space shuttle. They did do all sorts of interesting things when they were testing the space shuttle to see its thermal dynamic properties um, and to see how, you know they put temperature sensors. They always had temperature sensors in the cargo bay but um, to see what kind of temperatures they could expect uh, when oriented differently and staying in certain orientations for a few hours, that sort of thing. For actually deorbiting, the shuttle uses about 100 meters per second, um, but after that it needs some RCS to hold its orientation through the atmosphere. As you would expect, uh, our KSP systems take a lot more RCS than the real shuttle probably would and so I need to reserve at least 300 for all of that uh, so in total we need 400 to actually deorbit the shuttle now we're going to have a lot of that once we get rid of the payload because the payload is quite heavy right now it's 15 tons or more I think uh, this is obviously not the best we'll have to circularize a little bit better than that but for now we can uh, well We'll wait until we're at the equator. Right now we're approaching the equator. And then deploy the payload closer to it. Maybe five degrees away. I think that's fine. Let's hold ourselves prograde. Lifting the payload up. I've tuned down the decoupler to make sure it's not too forceful. And that was not the separation. That is a nice graceful sort of decoupling. Uh, we can get that hinge back down. Uh, let's go back to default position. Okay, that should be fine. And now uh, let's work with this satellite. As it so happens, this particular model does not seem to have comms on it, uh, so I had to add two antennae. That's a bit ironic since it's basically uh, tracking in data relay satellite, which means it is uh, somewhat of a communication satellite. To make sure that we use the 2761 meters per second in this stage, it's actually about 2800, but I don't know why it's showing. Um, but we do not want to do that. That's too much. We mainly want to do that. But we don't want to get too far out there. So we'll do some of the inclination bit to burn the rest of the fuel. We definitely want to get past the 3, uh, 35,786 kilometers, which would be geo geosynchronous orbit because if we just barely hit it we won't be able to do the weird radial thing that we need to do and 
even this is probably not quite right. I'd have to calculate out ahead of time to figure out how much further we need to push this in order to give space for the radial burn that will ensure that we use all of the fuel from the second stage. Okay, uh, we don't really need to self-fuel that, I'm just uh, throttling up and ignition. So again, we're away from prograde to make use of all the fuel. If it looks like we're falling short, because this number is different from what uh, I was told in the VAB, I'll lean it towards prograde a bit. This uh, tracking and data relay satellite and these inertial upper stages uh, from the from Raider Nick's pack. I believe the US probes pack. Okay, let's separate off the first stage. And we are not following the first stage. We can shut that off. And let's coast to Apoapsis. Not quite Apoapsis actually. What we want to do is we want to coast to around here-ish. And then boost out. And then waste the rest of the en energy doing a radial burn. The actual, uh, this delta V is totally a lie. The amount of delta V that we have in the upper stage is about 2,043. So that's how much we want to use. I'm gonna say that the TDRS satellite can probably bring its orbit down after that, so we'll, we'll point out this. Uh, we should probably deploy the solar panels. It looks like our electric charge is going down. And it is quite a wonderful model for that. That is fancy stuff. Yep. Continuing on. Oop, a little bit past. Most of the electric charge drain seems to be from the booster stage. Okay, uh, not prograde. Node, please. Well, it doesn't matter if I throttle up anyway. Ignition. Now, this actually has an extendable nozzle. In order to fit the two stages together properly, uh, this no nozzle actually extends. I don't know if there's any other SRB that has an extendable nozzle, but that's pretty fancy. 289 second ISP, by the way. 76 uh, kilonewtons. Well, and it goes up. It has a, cr a thrust curve, too. We're looking for an orbital period, uh, 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4 seconds, but we're not going to get that. Thankfully, the the TDRS satellite itself has hydrazine. Unfortunately, um, it's not got the most powerful thrusters in the world. So, yeah. No, oh, we're going past. Uh... And I'll decide to follow the node, which is probably for the best. Okay, well, an extra hour and 26 minutes that the TDRS satellite will have to adjust. No, I don't want to follow that bit. That's not the interesting bit. Um, it actually uses differential thrust. All the thrusters are facing the same way. But it just relies on firing the correct ones in order to steer itself. Um, well, I could have to try and point retrograde, but we'll just end up seeing exactly how horrible the thrust of this is. Oh, actually point oh three G's is not too bad. Down a little bit further. Up, up, up. Oh, there's no backward facing one. Okay, I'll take this. 23 hours, 56 minutes. It's okay. Um, probably it should turn around or something. But we'll just leave it here. Let's get back to the shuttle, which is what we're supposed to be doing. So now, the interesting part of the project, bringing the shuttle back down. And I've been constantly tweaking this whole thing to make sure that I can handle different masses, for instance. And, uh, but of course, all from the same orbit. That's sort of critical. Let's just time warp a bit. Oop, there's a lot of flippiness. I want to bring the apoapsis down and the periapsis up. And then we're going to make sure that we have been in orbit about 23 hours before starting the return. 
It's easier if it's just a even day when you get back. Okay, so as we pass by, um, there's Florida right there. Uh, on the next orbit, so most of our re-entry unfortunately is going to be at nighttime. That's not the best sort of situation for sightseeing. But for now, we can get a map view, uh, close up the cargo bay, uh, check on our electric charge, which is actually full. Uh, that's probably because we spend most of the time with the TRS satellite. Um, we have an imbalance of MMH and N204. That might be because of the fuel cells. I think I might have turned the fuel cells on. I'm going to shut them off now. And uh, for some reason on this shuttle, they take MMH and N204 as fuel cell fuel instead of... Uh oh I forgot to retract that little guy. Hold on. Um, retract that little antenna. Uh, instead of hydro hydrogen and oxygen as they should. I'm not entirely sure why. Maybe it was just for convenience. Um, but here we are and we have enough fuel to return. I wanted to reserve 400 meters per second and we have that even though it was consuming our fuel in order to run the fuel cells which I didn't want it to do. But now I'm going to edit re-entry 2. Uh, I, I made adjustments and I have just recently made even more adjustments that I'm going to test. And hopefully I didn't do something to throw it off. Run re-entry 2. Okay, well, at least I didn't make a syntax error. So we're going to come back down. It's going to start the retro burn at 126 degrees east, which is, well, it's quite far away from the actual location where we're trying to land. It's about above, it might be a little bit past Australia. So it's all in the hands of KOS until we get down to uh, 5 kilometer alt altitude. At that point I'll take over. Uh, we'll probably be one side or another of the runway, uh, probably by maybe a mile. That's why I'm, I'm sh uh, I've still got some adjustments to do. Uh, the shell should be able to um, go right at the runway uh, with its cross-range ability, but I haven't got that part of the tweaking down yet. What it can do is I've allowed it to manage its pitch between 38 degrees and 45 degrees to make sure it's hitting certain latitudes at certain points in its trajectory. So when it hits certain altitudes, it checks to make sure that it's at a certain longitude. So you'll see it uh, relative altitude, relative longitude. Basically it cuts its uh, re-entry up into little chunks and it sees within that chunk you'll see where it's supposed to be in that chunk on the altitude going from 1 to 0 and where it is supposed to be in longitude going from 1 to 0 and then after it goes through one chunk it'll go through another chunk. The reason I did it that way is because uh, obviously it's going to be slowing down on the latter portions of its re-entry much more than the earlier portions. So we're going to be covering a different amount of latitude for a different amount of altitude depending on where we are in, in the re-entry. It's not a constant curve. And actually the worst part is you could try to do some sort of exponential curve and uh, imagine a flight path that's sort of a nice smooth curve, but it's not like that. And the lift of the shuttle actually uh, ends up flattening out its trajectory between 75 kilometers and 80 kilometers. It gets a lot of lift there and it starts slightly going up, uh, though not much. It hangs about that altitude for an extended period of time. So instead of being a nice smooth curve, it starts going down and then it flattens out and then it goes down again. So it's it can be tricky to come up with an equation to model that. The target periapsis that goes forward during the retro burn is dependent on its mass. And so the lighter it is, the higher the periapsis. The heavier it is, uh, the lower the periapsis will be. That's, I don't know if that's how the space shuttle did it, but that's how I'm doing it. It seems to be a reasonable way to go about it. The trouble is, uh, if you've got a heavier shuttle, 
it takes more drag to slow it down. And the, of course we can't increase the wing area of the shuttle, so what happens is it tends to go further when it's heavier. For this trip we are not carrying anything in the cargo bay, but I've tested this carrying about 12.5 uh, tons in the cargo bay back down. I tested it carrying two tanks, uh, um, two 12.5 ton tanks, and we deployed one 12.5 ton tanks and then uh, brought the other tank back down. So we brought up 25 tons and we brought down 12.5. So we can do that to a 300 kilometer orbit just fine uh, with uh, inclination of about 29 degrees. The, launch, uh, the descent program is uh, such that after 45 kilometers we don't use RCS anymore. So uh, assuming everything is all right, I'll use chip manifest to dump our MMH and N204 at 45 kilometers, which is still pretty high. And so we don't, we'll vent the fuel and we won't carry it back down with us. So right now you can see the shuttle is actually pitching up in response to where it is in a longitude versus altitude and it's pitched up to its full 45 degrees nominal is 40 degrees okay so here we are in the portion of the flight path where it's going to start going up and this is why it's a little bit hard to model it in fact uh, for my descent script it's told to just hold a pitch of 40 degrees. It's no longer trying to manage the altitude and longitude anymore. It's just told to go 40 degrees no matter what. Because it's too complicated to figure out which altitude is supposed to be at which longitude when it's not descending very much and it might actually start going up at any time and that can change depending on its mass. It's interesting that the shuttle doesn't really produce the normal flame effects when coming in for re-entry. Part of that's down to the fact that it doesn't produce much by way of g-forces either. And it's a very sort of comfortable ride back down. At this point the shell has decided that it's a little bit too far away from the KSC and so it's reduced its pitch but now it's uh, it looks like it's trending back to the nominal 40 degrees, so we're currently close to spot on our intended trajectory. We're still going at about half of uh, orbital velocity here, so plenty of speed to bleed off, but at this point, because we're in the thicker part of the atmosphere, that speed gets bled off very quickly. G-forces though, uh, 1.3 Gs, so still very mild, vertical speed, very well controlled. Okay, we are about five to six degrees west of of the KSC at sixty kilometers, three thousand one hundred meters per second. Once we hit forty-five kilometers, it'll start to pitch down. Because at that point if we don't pitch down, it'll lose velocity too quickly, and we'll stall. After that point, it takes about one degree longitude to get to the point where it hands control over to me. After I get control, the glide, it, it can glide for about half a degree of longitude. I'm measuring everything in terms of longitude because that's how the script is written and that's how I've got organized in my head. Because we didn't really have distance to the KSC for anything, I've sort of measured it like this. So right now we're at about Mach 5 and we're approaching that uh, critical 45 kilometer point and it looks like we might go a little bit too far again it takes about one degree of uh, longitude to get to the point where it hands off to me and the KSC is at 8 degrees and 36 minutes to 40 minutes uh, depending on where on the runway you're measuring from the KSC is actually around there. So here we go for the pitch down and RCS is off and at this point I'm going to dump the RCS fuel. 
we're still above a hundred thousand well I think about a hundred and thirty thousand feet by the way for those who need so we're definitely stratospheric okay all of the RCS fuel is purged it does this sort of wiggly thing we'll call that turbulence for now it's not something I'm pressed to fix We have bigger fish to fry, if you will. I'm worried that it might actually be too on target, in which case it won't leave me enough time to turn for the runway. We're now at about 60,000 feet, 18 kilometers, Mach 3. And you can see we actually get a little bit of flame effects here out of all things. We didn't get any during re-entry, but we get some of them here. That's, a, that's actually because we are hitting fairly high G's here, 2.2 G's, more than we hit during the rest of re-entry. This negative 20 degree pitch is normal for this phase of flight, actually. Okay, I'm going to use this autopilot helper, and that's just to stabilize it once we get off of... Uh, KOS, but you can see it's no longer wiggling now that we're below Mach 1. Normally the shuttle would basically be at that negative 20 degree pitch all the way into the runway and then just pull up right at the last bit. But they did do glide tests and it is capable of some level of gliding. One odd thing about this model is that the split rudder brakes, you'll notice it'll only have brakes on one side, I don't know why. That's an annoyance. It's also critical that we dump a lot of velocity. We don't want to come in too hot. Oop, oop. That's not what I wanted to do. We are definitely not going to ditch. What we need is lots of brakes now. And you can see uh, the split rudder, only one of them coming out. Very annoying. Double check that our wheels are down. We've got the stock wheels, so they're a little bit small. I'm probably going to come down a little bit faster than I ought to. Uh, that didn't work out quite right. Come on, get down, baby. Okay. Oh, fudge. Ah, that's not nominal. I think I may, might need to tune down those drag shoots a bit. They're a little bit OP. Well, we're down. So there you have it, folks. A complete shuttle mission. Yep. Jeb, Bill and Bob, and Valentina managed to come back safely. And now we can do shuttle missions all day long. This is, this is the dream come true, right? Now, in Realism Overhaul, we can manage shuttle missions in good time. In total, this mission to get the TDRS satellite into orbit and bring the shuttle back down took one hour and a half. So, that's pretty doable. That's pretty doable. We can do some serious shuttle missions, folks. Let's recover this puppy. Bob's clapping. Everybody's clapping. Drinks all around. <laughs>